welcome everyone to the webinar on how to set up um, the Brain Analyzer and the Homer toolboxes. My name is Patrick Britz. I'm the general manager from Nyrex. I've been working in neuroscience research and industry for 20 years. I come from a background of EEG and fMRI, and I'm rather new to FNIRS. I would like to use this opportunity to let you know that FNIRS, that the FNIRS community is an outstanding crowd. Yes, it's a hard situation for many. Still, you did not break stride. You went on to put your mind towards how to help, how to make the best out of the situation, and to see opportunities. Compared to the fields I worked in before, FNIS is a young field, and there are not so many tools readily available and not so much expertise around the corner to find. I experienced the FNIS crowd as, even by research standards, highly innovative, positive towards each other, willing to share knowledge and expertise. Because it is such a young field, sharing is such an important part. This is a good segue to the webinar. I would like to say thanks for the many that joined to really motivate us. I would like to give a very special thanks to those willing to share their knowledge, Ted and Miriam. Thank you very much, Ted, for joining us. Um, it's an honor to have two leaders from the FNIS data analysis field join us for the webinars. We're very grateful. And of course, thanks to the team that put this together nicely and quickly. I wish you fun and learning and hand over to Maria Adelila. Uh, thanks, Patrick. So I'll just um, tell a little bit how it will work today. So we have two, brain, two, two boxes that will be shown for you today. So just so you have an idea how it will be. The first one will be the Ashley will give the first part and she will tell a little bit how to download, update, understand the baseline. And uh, we also have here on board today for our Q&A session, uh, Dr. Ted Huppert, which is one of the developers of the Brain Analyzer Toolbox. So we are very, very happy to have him here. Um, for the second part, we will have then Blanca Perez-Sempere, which is our other um, support um, consultant. And she will also show you how to download a data, a data structure for the for the Homer 3 and understand the GUI and also Q&A session. So I have received some questions about the, the data set that we sent today. So here you'll be able to understand how to open these data sets. And yeah, uh, hopefully you get everyone through this. Uh, just some reminders so all of you are muted. We welcome questions at any time. So the, there's a panel in the GoToWebinar where you can uh, write your write your your questions. We will be here getting all the questions. We know that there's a lot of people. Uh, we have a high attendance rate. We might not be able to to answer all the questions, but we will follow up all the questions later on. Um, also, I'd like to 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 let you know that we'll have all the content available in the website uh, afterwards. So, yeah, hope you enjoy our webinar. And please, Ashley, I will let you present now. All right, thank you very much, Made. Um, I will, I'm just waiting for that to become a presenter. Okay, show my yeah. screen. Okay. Um, so just to confirm, you can see my uh, PowerPoint presentation here, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I can see you. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining um, and your interest in the NEARS toolbox, also known as Brain Analyzer. Um, the, it's an interchangeable word, really. So today I'll be covering installation of the toolbox and getting started with so the, the goal of, of this webinar in advance of next week's webinar is to get you started with these toolboxes so that the mechanics are familiar to you. And by the time we get to next week with Dr. Huppert and Miriam presenting on their toolboxes in depth and on FNIRS analysis concepts, you'll already know the mechanics of these toolboxes. Um, the goal here, I'll be showing installation of the toolbox as well as, um, uh, you know, a basic pipeline in the toolbox. Don't have to follow along with me right now. This is just to get you started with it. Um, this video will be available later as well as the slides, so you can follow along step by step then. Right now, just focus on taking some notes um, and getting back to installing the toolbox later. Um, and yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. 
So why Nears Toolbox? Well, it was created by Dr. Huppert and his team um, at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, they support it and update it regularly. Um, normally, Dr. Hubbard gives a nice introduction to Nearest Toolbox, but we decided to give him a break this time around and have you know, a member of the NEARX team give this introduction. Um, Nearest Toolbox can pull from other programs such as Homer 2, Nears SPM, and Field Trip. Um, not, only to, not, not only does this add functionality to the Nearest Toolbox, but it also allows you to compare um, functionality from other, uh, from other toolboxes. And this is really going to help the field you know, advance you know, questions about methods. Um, it's extremely versatile with many different analysis options, such as the general linear model with pre-whitening, um, functional connectivity, image reconstruction, subject and group analysis, and it also integrates with data from other modalities, such as MRI and EEG. Um, and here on the right, we have an image that's of, of data that's generated by the toolbox. So it's a very powerful tool, and I'm excited that you're here uh, to learn about it with me. So how do we run the nearest toolbox? Well, there's three general steps. First, you'll need to install MATLAB if you don't already have it. Then you'll download the nearest toolbox. And finally, you'll place the nearest toolbox in um, your MATLAB path. So starting off, installing MATLAB if you don't already have it. Um, nearest toolbox runs within the MATLAB environment uh, 2014B or later. Um, if you don't have a license um, and you have any trouble getting a license from your institution, there are 30-day free trials available from MathWorks. So you'll Google Get MATLAB, or you'll follow this link, and you'll download um, your, Mat, uh, your MATLAB license. Okay, now on to downloading the nearest toolbox from GitHub. So recently, the toolbox migrated from, a, from Bitbucket to GitHub. This is where it's held. It's still held on Bitbucket, Bitbucket technically, but as of earlier this month, Dr. Hubbard and his team moved it to GitHub. Um, and uh, you'll access it by following this link. Um, you can click clone or download in the top right corner, and then you'll have the toolbox. You'll unzip the folder, you'll place it in your MATLAB path, and that'll be that. However, note that this is a static download. So you're downloading this folder, you're unzipping it, and that's it. It's never going to update um, unless you go and download this entire folder again, and that will be incumbent on you to do so. It's not exactly the best way to do it. It's a nice fallback, though, so I figured I, I would mention it. Um, to update it, uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, to update it uh, um, remotely and very easily, you can do so with Tortoise HG. So Tortoise HG is an application that allows you to pull um, updates automatically as Dr. Huppert and his team upload them to their GitHub repository. Um, it allows for seamless remote updates. Um, it only requires you to install Tortoise HG and then clone the repository. So I'll be showing you how to do that. First, I just want to show you the Tortoise HG interface. So I've got, over here, I've already cloned my repository. And so I've got each of these line items are various updates that Dr. Huppert and his team have pushed. Um, each update, it gives you a little summary of what, what it is, and it gives you the code that's been changed and the lines of code that have been changed. So you can see that oftentimes, they're just adding a couple of different lines of code here and there, um, in addition to some you know, fairly major updates. So it, you don't need to download the entire six gigabyte folder every time they have an update. You can use this repository. It's a much better way to go. So coming back to my presentation. Oops, just skipping on through. So um, to install Tortoise HG, you'll download it. You'll go to the, you'll either Google Tortoise HG or go to this link over here. You'll uh, you can download Tortoise HG for Windows, Macs, and Linux. Um, I've listed the latest. Um, the latest versions of Tortoise HG here for Windows and Mac. You'll download the file, you'll unzip it, you'll run it. So you'll just double click on it to start the installation process. This is what it looks like in Windows. This is what it looks like in Mac. And you'll just follow the default install prompts. Next, you'll just need to change one setting in your Tortoise HG um, application. You just need to enable GitHub downloads. To do that, um, on a PC, you'll go to File, Settings, Extensions, and you'll declare HG Git. And on a Mac, you'll go to Tortoise HG, Preferences, Extensions, um, and you'll also click HG Git. And then after that's done, you need to restart your application. Um, I just like to go ahead and restart the whole computer to ensure that the setting has been applied. Okay. Next, you'll clone the repository. So it's the same process in Mac and Windows. You go to File, Clone Repository. You set your source uh, to this hyperlink. This is the repository on GitHub. 
um, making sure that you have this little dot, dot .git at the end. Um, you'll set your destination to a folder of your choice. So the, desti the destination is a folder somewhere on your computer. The source is the um, GitHub repository. The destination is on your computer. You can put it anywhere in any folder. Just note where you put it. Um, having it in your MATLAB folder is a good idea. Um, and finally, you'll then hit uh, clone and you will start the uh, download of the repository. Um, and one quick troubleshooting note, if you're ever prompted for username and password, you'll use your GitHub account. Uh, you might not have a GitHub account, you just need to make one there free. Um, you might not run into this prompt, but I did on occasion, so just a troubleshooting note there. Okay, finally, so we've installed MATLAB at this point, we've downloaded NIRS toolbox statically or dynamically, and now we just need to place NIRS toolbox in our MATLAB path. So to do that, there's two ways to do that. One is semi-permanently by adding it to your path in this manner. You'll go to home, you'll go to environment, set path, you'll go to add with subfolders, and you'll go to nearest toolbox, so or wherever, the, wherever you placed uh, your download. Another um, temporary way to add the folder to your path is to right-click on the folder in the file explorer, click add to path, and click selected folders and subfolders. So by doing this, you're ensuring that all the functions in your toolbox are able to be called upon um, in MATLAB. All right, and that's it. And then you'll be able to run, start running with your toolbox. Okay, so talking about uh, the toolbox flow, as I like to call it, just to kind of conceptualize how the toolbox works. Um, so here I've got the MATLAB interface up. On the left-hand side, I've got my current folder, my working directory. This contains toolbox functions and classes. Next, I've got um, my script up. This is demo code or my own code that I'm scripting up. We'll be scripting up some code together soon. And finally, we've got data objects um, on the far right side. So these are, this is our FNIRS data um, pulled in and um, at, at various points in our pipeline, we'll create data objects that will fill up this space. Okay, talking about the code structure of NIRS Toolbox. So NIRS Toolbox uses object-oriented programming. For those not familiar with object-oriented or object -oriented programming or not programmers, don't fret. Um, you will be using this and learning this in practice. Um, but So a namespace is basically, uh, it defines an environment um, which has a bunch of functions and variables within it. Essentially, it sets the scope um, of all these functions and variables, and it's a folder. It's, yeah, it's literally just that, it's a folder. Uh, and a class is a data object, uh, a data structure, excuse me. Um, and with this kind of programming, it allows for very um, context-specific calling of, of variables and functions. This is very versatile and allows us to um, use, you know, our complex FNIRS analysis pipelines in a very easy and powerful way. And we'll see this in action soon here. So uh, to use this object-oriented programming, we'll be using the dot operator quite a bit. So the dot operator, all it does is it, it kind of navigates you through namespaces um, and properties of objects. So for example, when we want to call a function in the nearest toolbox, um, we're going to call the first namespace folder that it's in. Um, so this is the first group of folders within the nearest toolbox. You can see we've got EEG, nears, demos, and so on. Nears has a lot of the functions that we'll be calling. Uh, within nears, there's a modules um, folder and namespace. And finally, there's a baseline correction function that we're interested in and that we want to call. So in order to call this baseline correction, we have to use this dot operator here and here uh, to specify exactly where that function is. Okay, and similarly with an object, so this is refers, rather than a function, this is referring to a data structure. Now, um, to access a property within an object, we use this dot operator as well. So we've got um, an object name, um, a property, and a sub-property that we're looking to modify or change or call upon. So for example, take an object, a data object that's called raw. Uh, we wanna access the probe property. And within that, we wanna access the default draw function and we're setting that equal to 3D mesh. So that's the flow. We've got the dot operator. You, you can, it does help to actually like visualize what, what exactly is being called. Um, and we'll see that with the toolbox here shortly. Okay, let's have another example of loading in a single data set with the nearest toolbox and that's the first thing you'll be doing anyway, so it's a good place to start. So um, take loading data, that's all gonna be contained within the nears.io namespace. So um, nears toolbox is capable of loading um, a number of different um, FNIRS data formats that are commonly available. So there's a number of 
um, FNIRS manufacturers um, data formats that you can load in. There's also some open source formats like load SNRF and load.NIRS. Um, I'll be focusing today on loading NIRX and loading .NIRS, and I'll show you, um, yeah, I'll show you how that works and how that, um, how that creates our data structure for us. So loading in our data a raw with um, load NIRX or load .NIRS, it creates this raw data structure, excuse me, this raw object which has a certain data structure that we will be um, taking a look at. Um, so to get a little specific here with the function, um, we've got the dot operator, uh, two dot operators, our function of interest. We're specifying an input. In this case, this is our file uh, path and file name. And then we're specifying an output. So what we want um, to be created when we use the, what we want load near X to return for us. Okay, loading in multiple files. Um, there is an, that was, that last code was an example for loading in a single file. If you wanna load in multiple files, you can do so with the load directory function. Um, you'll specify a folder path and a folder hierarchy. Um, and then you'll be able to load in multiple files. And when you do so, um, our raw data, our raw object is no longer just one instance of a data set, it's now 17 instances. In my case, the directory I loaded had 17 uh, different uh, subjects. And so if I selected one of those um, objects, I would find that it had the same uh, data structure as we saw before as a single object. Um, and we access these objects, oops, excuse me, by calling uh, the number, the index of the object uh, within our overall object. Okay, so some further resources on the toolbox. Um, this paper written by Dr. Huppert and his team, the NIRS Brain Analyzer Toolbox, um, is it, published in Algorithms, is a really great place to start. It, it really, it explains a lot of the functionality and various um, algorithms available in the toolbox quite well. Um, in addition, Dr. Huppert's website uh, has a number of presentations if you look under publications. The NIRX port site also has a number of walkthrough videos and presentations, but note that you must be a NIRX customer to register for the support site to access these videos. And finally, um, I'll have to clarify this with Dr. Huppert when he comes back for the Q&A session, but I believe the wiki, is, the wiki was on Bitbucket, but it's not currently there. Um, so I, I believe it will be coming back soon. So there's also a wiki on the uh, repository that you'll be able to access. Okay, so on to the toolbox. All right, so I've pulled up MATLAB. Um, I'm gonna go over here to my MATLAB folder and I see that NIRS toolbox, it's part of my path. Um, because the option is not there to add it to the path, that means it's already on my path. So I can start calling functions within the toolbox um, freely. So I'm gonna come over here to this webinar folder. This contains the data that I want to load. So first I'm gonna load the .NIRS file. And to do that, I'm gonna declare a, an object raw. Uh, I don't have to call it raw, but I'm gonna call it raw um, for now. I'm gonna access nears.io.load.nears. Okay, so this is my function. Um, this is my output. Now I need to specify my input. So uh, in order to find my data set, I need to give, uh, I need to pass the, um, the data path as part of my uh, input. So this is my data path to my data set. I need to specify the file as well with the extension in it. Okay, and now I'm gonna run this code. Okay, so I now have this raw object in my workspace. Let's take a look at it. So um, this is my data set and contains not only raw voltage information, but it also contains a lot of other information like probe, time, auxiliary, stimulus, demographic, so on. So um, starting here with description, we've got where our file is located and the name of the file. We've got uh, the raw data itself. So these are all, um, uh, raw light intensity values. We've got our probe. So this is information about our sources and detectors. Um, coming over here to source positions, this gives us the coordinates of our sources. We've got detector positions. We've got uh, types. So this refers to you know, the wavelength of the data. We've got link. And this describes which channels, you know, which optodes forms channels that we're interested in and correspond to actual um, columns of data. So that's the probe object. 
um, coming over here to time. Um, so this is an array. This is as many, there's as many time entries as there are data samples, and this corresponds to the time um, that the data sample occurred. Um, the spacing of these is dependent, of course, on our sampling frequency. So over here, FS it corresponds with our sampling frequency of 10 hertz. So these are um, all spaced um, one over, a little over 10 apart. Um, and so we've got some more information like stimulus. Um, so these are our triggers. Um, let's take a look at this. So this is one of our triggers. It's called Stim Channel 1 by default. Um, uh, we've got the stimulus onset, duration, and amplitude. Um, so this data set corresponds to a finger tapping data set um, with condition one being left, condition two being right. Um, so Stim Channel 1 isn't really that meaningful of a name, so we'll end up changing it. Um, just keep a note of that. Yeah, so this is our raw, excuse me, this is our raw data structure, but this is just the data class. Um, so we'll see this over and over again, but with different kinds of data within it. Um, that's part of the object-oriented programming. Okay, so let's load dot nears. Now what I want to do is actually load via uh, nearx because um, when you load data via nearx, you actually get slightly more information than would be standard. So I'm going to go ahead and um, this is my nearx data set here. So I'm going to specify that as part of my path. I'm going to change this extension to .wl1 because .wl1 is the nearx file extension. Let me just check my code is correct. Okay, it is. Okay. Um, one second here, we'll have our new raw variable. So coming over here, just double clicking this, um, the uh, object is essentially the same, except we have more information with our probe. So NearX data comes with uh, 3D Atlas information by default. Um, most NearX data uses the widely used ICBM 152 Atlas. So this is, uh, not only are we getting information about the relationship between the, the optodes, but we're also getting information about uh, 3D anatomical uh, registration. So we've got um, LR arc length, AP arc length, head circumference. Um, under optodes registers, we see fiducials, if this would load for me. Um, we've got our sources and detectors and we also got some fiducials. So with this information um, you can do more, you, there's more functionality in the toolboxes available such as image reconstruction and region of interest analysis based on anatomical registration. Okay and we'll also be able to plot the probe in 3D space so we'll take a look at that he, here in a second. Um, but first what I want to do is, um, well I want to start commenting my code because it's going to make it much more readable. So here I loaded in my data. Okay. Next, um, the next thing I want to do is take a look at my stimulus. Okay. So we're going to call this stimulus. Sorry, just give me a second here. Okay. So uh, next we want to take a look at our stimulus. Um, to do that, we're going to pull up the stim, the stimutil GUI. So there are a couple of GUIs in NIRS toolbox, and I'll point out two of them here. So NIRS.viz has all the GUIs, and we're going to go to stimutil, and we're going to pass the rob variable to it. So this is my function, stimutil. Um, I'm going to be opening up a GUI, I'm passing the raw object to it, and I'm having raw as my output as well. That way, whatever changes I make in the stimutil GUI will be passed to the raw object. Okay, so I'm evaluating this section of code. I see my stim channel 1 and stim channel 2, and um, what, I want, what I want to do here is change the stimulus duration. So these by default are, are um, one sample. So I know that, in fact, my uh, stimuli were 10 seconds long. Um, note that we, all we have here is onset and duration. Um, we don't have offset, but since we know the duration, we don't need to have it in offset exactly. OK, so I'm manually doing this. You can do this through code, but I want to show you a mixture of the GUIs and the code so you can um, use whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, and later on I'll be renaming these uh, these stimulus, but for now I just wanted to change the duration. Okay, up next I want to plot my probe to get a see what it looks like. Probe. 
So first, let's just plot. Uh, let's just see what happens when we plot the probe. So we're going to call raw .probe .draw. Okay, so this is uh, this is our probe in 2D space. It's basically just the relationship of the sources and detectors um, laid out here for us. But there is there are more than one ways to draw the probe with the 3D anatomical registration. So if I come down here and I type in raw.probe.defaultDraw function, and I set that equal to a question mark, I can have a look at the various options for the default draw function. Um, so I can plot it in, with, in 1020 space. I can plot it with a 3D mesh. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try 1020 and 3D mesh here. So I'm going to set my raw.probe.default draw function to be equal to 1020. And then I'm going to create a new figure and I'm going to plot uh, that probe. Okay, and I want to see it more than one way. So I'm also going to declare it um, as 3D mesh. Okay, so now we have um, our probe with 1020 information um, in a 2D uh, projection, and we've also got it in 3D here. So this also contains uh, 1020 um, information. Coming over here to Tools, uh, Rotate 3D, I can have a look at the probe even further. Sorry, my computer's a little slow with the video. Um, so yeah, this is our probe. We've got, um, this is a 16-16 montage over the left and right motor cortices. This is a finger tapping task. Um, so now we have a, a good sense of where the probe lies. Um, and we can use this further for further uh, interpretation of our data, um, the, the draw functions. Okay, moving right along. Um, we've kind of explored our data here. Now let's go ahead and start pre-processing it. Ah, I wanna add spaces here so I can have different sections of my code. Um, so pre-process. Um, the first function I want to call here is renaming my stimulus. So that's under nears.modules.renameStims. So to call this function, I need to pass an input. What is the input? Well, when you start to run functions in the nears toolbox, you're going to do what's called creating jobs. So um, jobs are essentially, it's a pipeline that you're applying. We're going to be, um, you, you create a list of jobs and then you run them at the same time. We're going to be creating two different lists of jobs to end up and we're gonna be applying them. Um, so let's just go ahead and see this in action. We're gonna set jobs equal to this function. And when we first call our first function, we're gonna pass an empty argument. Um, later on, we'll be passing on jobs as an input to create our list of jobs. So uh, it, I wanna rename my stims, but I need to tell the code what to rename my stims to. Um, to know how to do that, I'm gonna come over to my nearest toolbox folder Double click it, it's a little slow right now, again, because the video. Um, coming over here to um, under Nears Toolbox, we see all these various namespaces that we saw earlier in the presentation. I'm gonna come over here to Nears, I'm gonna come over to Modules, and I'm gonna come to Rename Stims. Okay, um, so over here, um, I've got some comment in this code to help me understand mm, how to use this function. So I've got an example code, um, I call rename stims and I'm gonna give a list of changes. So here we have um, an example where we had uh, triggers were listed as misspelled horror, horror two, oh my God, this name is too dang long and we're changing them to nice name one, two and three. Um, so we, that is how I can, I, this is how I can understand the syntax for my code and what exactly I wanna call. So I wanna call um, jobs.list of changes curly bracket, dot, dot, dot. Um, so the name of my trigger is stim channel one. The name that I want to call it is left. And the name of my next trigger is stim channel two. And the name I want to call it is right. Okay, so that is one job that I've pushed. Now I want to add another job. I want to resample my data. 
So this is done uh, to deal, downsampling your data is done to deal with the high autocorrelation in FNIR signal. So this is a common pre-processing step. Um, so now that um, I'm calling a job, the second um, function within this job, I'm passing jobs as an argument. Okay, and I just need to set the property of this job as well. So I'm setting that to um, jobs.fs equals four. Okay, now we're going to want to change our raw intensity values to changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Nears.modules.optical density. So converting to optical density is the first step. And then we want to uh, call on the modified Beer-Lambert law. Okay, and now we can run our job. So to do that, um, we are going to call jobs.run, simply jobs.run. We're going to pass the object that we want to raw the, excuse me, raw, run the jobs on, and we're going to declare what we want the output to be. So I'm going to declare this the output to be HB. Okay, and now I'm going to run the section of code. Oops, I must have had a spelling error here. All right, we now have um, our data is now in terms of changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So let's take a look at the difference between raw and HB. So these are, it's the same uh, data class, but we've got different information contained within the data class. So um, looking at the differences between the two, one that pops out at sampling frequency, that's because we downsampled the data. Um, also correspondingly, then the time vector will be smaller as well as the data, the number of data points. Um, We've also, let's see what else. If we were to go to stimulus, we would see that the names have changed. So those are some of the changes that we've implemented. Um, of course, also the data is now in terms of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin concentrations rather than um, raw intensity values. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what's going on there. Uh, I'll also point your attention over here. We can see that uh, under value, it defines what kind of class we're using. So we're making changes to the data class. Okay, moving right along to analyzing the data. So um, that was a pretty minimal pre-processing stream. Um, but since we'll be applying a general linear model with pre-whitening, that's actually an okay thing to do in many cases. So um, we're calling the general linear model um, algorithm to do that. We're gonna call nears.modules.glm. We're starting a new group of jobs. So again, we, we're gonna pass an empty argument. Um, next, we're gonna call jobs equals nears.modules.export data. Uh, this is done basically because we're going to be taking our, going from a data object to a, st a, a, st um, a statistics object. Don't worry so much about this. Just go ahead and do it if you're running a general linear model um, function. We're going to declare jobs, the output of this to be subject stats. And we're going to say data, we're now going to run the jobs. We're going to call the new object data equals jobs.runhb. So we're going to pass the hemoglobin values to run this job. And now we can call in this code. So down here, this is a, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a progress bar. It's going pretty fast because it's just one subject. Um, and not too many fancy algorithms going on here. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, now we can see we've, we've got a couple new objects. Um, it's no longer a data object, they're called channel stats. So if we click on here, subject stats, this has now has different a different structure than the raw, um, than the raw object. So we've got uh, beta values, that is the results of our general linear model with corresponding T stats, um, P values, these are all dependent on um, the beta values and degrees of freedom and so on. So this is, yeah, this is the results of our analysis. This is a full pipeline. Um, we could take this information to um, group level analysis if we had multiple uh, subjects. So one last thing I'll do is I'll display the results of our analysis. Um, we can do that with some of the visualizations in Nears Toolbox. So to do that, I call subject stats one because I just want, I'm just looking at the first subject. If I had multiple subjects, I would call the corresponding subject uh, number. I want to look at the T statistic. 
I want to um, have my range of values between negative 10 and 10. And I only want to plot data that has a p-value um, less than 0.05. So statistically significant. Missing a quotation mark there. Okay, let's give this a whirl. Okay, so since we set our default draw function to 3D mesh, this information is plotted onto a 3D mesh probe. Um, yeah, so these are our beta values for our right and left conditions. Now, of course, you can draw contrast stats. These are just regular T statistics of the individual conditions. But this is just to show you, yeah, this is the kind of results you can end up with. Let's go ahead and take a look at HBO left. Um, so if I go to rotate 3D, I can have a look to see where my activation was most statistically significant. And I'm seeing it right over the motor cortex for this finger tapping task. That's what I, what I, what I would expect specifically the right motor cortex for the left condition. Uh, and correspondingly, let's take a look over here. Yes, we see activation in the uh, left motor cortex for the right task. So um, again, the point here is not really to talk about FNIR's analysis so much as just the mechanics of the toolbox and getting to this point of, of getting results in your data. Um, so um, moving forward, um, we'll have the Q&A session shortly. Um, but your homework is to play with the data that we sent you to load that into NIRS toolbox, um, as well as there's a number of really helpful demos in the toolbox that I'd recommend. So if we come over here to NIRS toolbox um, demos, um, Dr. Hubbard and his team have created a number of demonstrations of various functionality. There's a basic FNIRS analysis demo, which covers all of what we covered and more. Um, going through single and group level analysis, um, functional connectivity demonstration, imagery construction, and so on. So I'd really recommend two things, loading in the data set that we send you, um, as well as having a look at this FNIRS analysis demo before next week to give you a good sense of the toolbox. So thank you for listening. Um, that's all of my presentation for now. So now we can start the Q&A portion. Um, Dr. Huppert, if you're there, and Made, if you're there to moderate as well. Hey, hi, Ashley. Thank hi. you very much for your for your presentation. We do have some questions. There are some also some um, observations that Dr. Hooper uh, maybe want to want to add for your for your for your presentation. Some of the functionalities that we maybe it would be nice to to mention, Dr. Hooper, if you wanna if you wanna start with this. Uh... Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, there, the the. Um... I guess one thing, uh, so when you create these pipelines, like the GLM one, um, so you have your whole pipeline, your job, you can say job.site, uh, C-I-T-E, job.site, and it'll actually mm -hmm. list any publications uh, that you, you should cite for the methods you just used. So in the case of the GLM one, depending, actually you have it open, so, so you can mm -hmm. type uh, jobs.site and it'll, it'll give you the citation for anything within that step. If you have an entire pipeline, the Beer Lambert Law, the resample, uh, and, and so on, multiple steps, it'll actually list every publication that was part of that entire pipeline. Um, um, I guess the other thing too to mention as, as you're learning MATLAB is um, a lot of times you might not remember exactly what the function is. So for example, the Beer Lambert Law. Um, but you remember it starts with nears.modules. something with beer Lambert law in it. So what you can do is you can type near, you can type as much as you know. So you can type nears mm -hmm. dot, and if you hit the tab key, it'll actually tell you all the options at that point. Um, so, she, so, so she typed nears.modules, and now it lists all the modules. And so you can scroll through and try to find the one that you're, you're looking for. Um, so, so if you remember, it began with a B and you typed B and you hit tab and it'll only show you the ones it'll try to auto-complete. Uh, so just a, a little trick because a lot of times it, you don't, there's a lot of functionality there and remembering exactly what everything is called and is it an uppercase B and a lowercase law or, or what, it gets a little confusing even for me. I spell thing, I use that tab uh, trick all the time. Um, 
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hubbard. I appreciate you sitting through my presentation on your own toolbox. Um, I just wanted to ask about the wiki, actually. Um, oh, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, so Bitbucket, um, so we used to use, uh, Bitbucket used to support um, what's, what's called Mercurio, which is a way of, when I make changes, I keep a history of those changes. And then when I have a stable release, I'm able to then push it on to, to, to Bitbucket. Um, and so there was a local copy that I had with all its revisions and then a Bitbucket, you know, ready for prime time release uh, version. And unfortunately, Bitbucket discontinued use of that. Um, and so we had to migrate it all over to the, the get functionality um, and in doing so, unfortunately, we had to, we lost the wiki uh, completely. Um, mm -hmm. and, and now I think we're on revision like 30 and we used to be on revision like 800. So we lost that whole history too. I, I'm trying to restore it. Um, I will try to put the wiki back up. Um, unfortunately, I have to write it from scratch uh, because it was mm -hmm. completely lost in, in Bitbucket. Um, but I will try to do that. Um, uh, or Nerex could do that for me, because that'd be nice. Um, but I, I will try to get that up um, as as a as a reasonably high priority item. Sounds good. Yeah, we can definitely help you with that. So, okay. So uh, some of the questions that we have here. Um, first of all, we have uh, one question that. Asking about so the Beer Lambert law, law contain a PPF uh, predefined value, and uh, the user wants to know if it means the same PPF as in Homer, and if we have so, any recommendation for for infant data or something. Okay, so so PPF the partial path length factor. <laughs> I think you called it the pretty fine factor. <laughs> um, partial path length. So, so, so Beer-Lambert law has, the modified Beer-Lambert law has a couple of terms, uh, acronyms that get thrown around. And unfortunately, kind of in the literature, including Homer, they kind of get used um, wrong and interchangeably when they're not actually exactly the same. So, so the, the Beer-Lambert law, the first thing is um, the idea of the modified Beer-Lambert law. This is how far, we need to know how far the light traveled through the tissue. And when it goes through tissue, it doesn't go straight, it diffuses. So, so there's two factors that we, we have to account for. The first is scattering. And so while your source detector might be, say, three centimeters long, or this, let's play with my finger, it might be a centimeter across my finger, when I shine light through my finger, it travels closer to about six centimeters. Uh, because it doesn't go straight, it wanders back and forth. And so that factor of six, the, the actual dis the, the linear distance, one centimeter, times this correction factor of six, which gives me how far the light actually went, that's what's called the differential path length factor, the DPF. Okay, so the DPF corrects for the fact that light doesn't go straight. So generally, we use a value of six uh, for most of the brain imaging. Uh, it depends a little bit about on the wavelength. Um, there's references that talk about how this depends on age and, 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 and so on. It depends on the anatomy of the head. So a lot of times this is just kind of a guess. Uh, we don't have the structural MRI. We don't have the exact anatomy of the subject. And even if we did, we'd only be modeling it. We wouldn't know it exactly. Uh, but most people use this factor of six for correcting the differential path length. Okay, so the differential path length corrects for how far the light traveled through the tissue. But if we're talking about the brain, we also have to worry about what's called the partial volume. Because if I have my source detector on my head and I'm sending the light in, it might have traveled six centimeters, but only a very small fraction of that was actually in the tissue of interest. So when I do brain task, the expectation is my brain changed and not my skin or my skull and, and so on. And so we have to correct for that, that partial volume that only a small fraction of that six centimeters was actually spent in the brain. And so 
uh, the Beer Lambert law, in addition to correcting with the DPF, which corrects for scattering, we also have a term called the partial volume uh, factor, the PVC, which corrects for this, how much of that tissue, how much of that path was actually spent in the brain itself. And that also depends on the anatomy. It depends on what part of the brain you're looking at, but kind of a rough estimate is around a 60th, one over 60 that of that six centimeters, only a 60th of that was actually spent in the actual brain itself. And those those numbers come from, uh, Gary Strangman has a paper back in uh, 2004 or five-ish uh, called Factors That Affect the Quantitative Accuracy of Nears that did modeling to try to come up with those, those values. But again, it's kind of a guess. Um, and so, so you'll, you'll often see this DPF, the scattering correction of six, this partial volume correction, this PVC, which is oftentimes one over 60, and then the combined term, uh, which is PPF, the partial path line factor, which is the combination of both DPF and partial volume correction, which is the product of those two which is six divided by 60, which is 0.1, which is the default that's used in my toolbox. So it becomes really confusing because there's these three terms, they all look very, very similar. Um, they all kind of do the same thing of correcting for different things. So if you're using a value of six, um, you're, you're actually, so if you say PPF equals six, what you're effectively doing is you're saying, I'm correcting for the DPF part, I'm giving it a value of six, but I'm not correcting at all for the partial volume. Uh, so you're giving it a value of one, and that you know, six times one is six. If you wanted to correct for both of these, the, the path to scattering, the DPF, and the partial volume, you would put in something like six uh, divided by 60, or 0.1, which is the default that's used in my toolbox. So in my toolbox or in Homer, you can use, um, you know, depending on what you set that for, you can correct for scattering and or uh, partial volume. Um, I think in Homer, they say PPF equals six, which is basically correcting for the scattering part, but not the partial volume. Whereas in my code, I correct for both. Uh, by default, but you can actually change it uh, if you want it. If you put it in as six, it would only correct for that differential uh, path line, the scattering part. I know that's really, really confusing. That usually takes me about three or four times explaining it with students before they 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 kind of get. And it's usually me writing on whiteboards uh, to to jot down all these 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 terms. So if there's any more questions, I can answer that. Thank you. Thank you very invent, much. I didn't invent the terms. I didn't come up with the nomenclature, so please don't shoot the messenger. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Herper. This is actually a question that really comes every time we, we explain the toolbox, so it's very, very good to have you here explaining. It was really, really nice. Uh, but we do have more questions. I even asked Milan's help here to, so we can get most of the questions. Unfortunately, I already foresee that we cannot get to all of them, but we will do our best. So Milan, can you please ask the, the next one? Thank you. Yes, this is a very good problem to have. And like we mentioned yes. at the beginning, we're taking notes of all the questions. We will follow up with all of them. But unfortunately, we will not be able to address them all today. So I do have a question about the pre-processing steps. Uh, the question is, is the combination of PCA and pre-whitening recommended or just use pre-whitening? So um, pre-whitening, and um, we have a paper, if you read that, that nearest toolbox uh, paper that Ashlyn um, kind of put in the, the, the website, that site, or the, the webinar, that cites all the previous papers um, describing a little bit more of the math. And we had a paper, um, we have a couple papers on that math of pre-whitening. But what the pre-whitening is trying to do is it corrects for the fact that we're measuring uh, this very slow hemodynamic response, but sampling at eight hertz or whatever, which is much faster than the response itself. So we oversample. And the, the result of that is we have less degrees of freedom than we think we have. We have a thousand measurements, but we might only have 
uh, you know, a hundred actual independent measurements because all of those points were actually related to each other because my noise is slow and, and so on. This is what's called serially correlated error. And the result of that is you get really, you can get really high false positives because you think you had a lot more measurements than you actually did. Um, and so the autoregressive, the pre-whitening is a way of getting uh, the statistics right so that when your t-test asks how many degrees of freedom, uh, you have a, an answer that's based on, on, on your data. The PCA, the principal component, so principal component can be used with the pre-whitening. They do different things. Um, the principal component, depending on how you use it, it's designed to remove either systemic physiology or motion artifacts. And in general, what it's designed to do is remove things that are global that change all of your, your probe uh, together. So, so uh, if you use all of your data, all your wavelengths together, then it's trying to remove features that change the entire probe that didn't care about wavelength. And so this ends up acting like motion uh, correction. Your motion artifact, which the whole probe moved, it maybe lifted off the head or whatever, every channel saw this, PCA will remove that. Uh, if you, so in that case, it can act like a motion correction um, under the assumption that the motion affected the entire probe. Um, if your probe is disjointed, so say you have a left and a right motor cortex probe, and these things are moving independent uh, of each other because they're not linked, they're not one solid unit on the head cap, then that assumption of everything moving together starts to break down. Um, and so you have to be a little bit careful because uh, it's really just designed. It's not it's not printing out motion. It's printing out things that change the whole probe. Um, and if that assumption is not met, that algorithm doesn't work as well. When you apply it to just oxyhemoglobin or just deoxyhemoglobin and look at just what is global to an oxyhemoglobin signal, now it's it, it's also going to remove motion artifacts, but now it can also remove things like blood pressure and you know heart rate and stuff like that because that's a systemic that's affecting the entire probe. So they can be used uh, together with each other. Um, we tend, in, in my lab, we tend to use minimum pre-processing where if I don't, um, by using the, the GLM model to get the stats right and that pre-whitening, if um, um, uh, you don't necessarily need to do the PCA as, as well, it doesn't necessarily hurt, but you don't, all, you don't need to do it as, as, as aggressively. And we tend to prefer uh, the, the less pre-processed data, the less manipulation, uh, and just kind of let the stats uh, take care of it. And worst case scenario, if we had a lot of motion or had a lot of physiology, we might have to increase our sample size to overcome that, um, as opposed to justifying why we chose three components versus two versus kind of these more subjective. Um, and I was trying to talk fast in that answer, but I realized they put us even further behind. Uh, so stop asking good <laughs> questions. <laughs> Yes, that's that's a good problem that we're having right now. The questions are extremely very good, good questions. Will, yes, all of them. I think we will do uh, two more questions. One quick, short one for Ashling. One more, I think, for you, uh, Ted, and then we will move on to the next part of the presentation. Ashling, we have some uh, people that were asking if what basically if you use the same data set that was sent earlier to do the demonstration that you just did. Mm -hmm. And I also have a side question, which uh, someone is asking if the analysis that you did are also apl applicable when using other FNIRS equipments. So, for example, a Hitachi system. So the first question was, is the data set that I showed the same that they have? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, finger tapping data sets, uh, 10 seconds of each condition. Um, five instances of each condition. And then uh, applicable to other uh, modalities. Dr. Harper, I'll let, let you answer that. Yeah, no, the, the, the only thing that changes with mm -hmm. other modalities is the load function. So in the case of Hitachi, for example, you would use nears.io input output. So nears.io.load Hitachi uh, as opposed to load nearx. Now that load directory function, 
what it does is actually if you point to a folder and the folder contains all these subjects worth of, of data, it'll actually figure out, it'll look for, do you have a dot uh, WL1, which is a NIRX extension? Do you have a dot NIRS uh, extension? Do you have, um, I forget what Hitachi uses, uh, HBA, no, um, CSV. Um, do, do, do you have that extension? And if so, it, it calls the appropriate um, um, uh, load function. Um, and once it's loaded in, then it's this data class that you can run all the jobs on, you can draw the stats, et cetera. Uh, with something like Hitachi, it might not be 3D registered, whereas the NeurX data came in and it was you could automatically draw it on the surface of the brain. With Hitachi, you have to do an additional step to register it uh, because the data file itself doesn't contain that information. Um, but once it's in the toolbox, it looks, you know, it, it acts the same way as all the other data sets. I gotta learn to talk faster, talk simpler. <laughs> Please don't, please don't. Last question. Um, <laughs> whose extension coefficient are you using for calculating HB, HBO2 concentrations? Because it is known there is some deviation among different authors. Well, let's look. Uh, so Ashlyn, can you type mm -hmm. uh, job equals nears.modules.beerlambert? Because let's use that site function. Oop, jobs.modules.beer. Lambert. You might have to, ca uh, so, so sorry, oh, jobs equals bad. nears dot, yeah. Nears. And if you hit tab, mm -hmm. so you spelled it wrong, but if you hit tab, it'll try to auto-complete. So if you remember, it was beer something. <laughs> beer Lambert Law, there we go. Okay. okay. So now, now type um, jobs dot site. So you see the PPF is 0.1. Uh, if we change that to six, that would be, um, so it's using the ones from uh, Steve Jacques paper, um, who, which is basically a summary of, um, he basically compiled all the oxy, you know, all the, um, the tissue and the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin uh, spectral, uh, and kind of came up with a composite uh, answer uh, based on a whole bunch of different citations, and that's the one we're using. Um, I probably, one of the things I've been meaning to do is changing that Beer Lambert law to allow you to select which one you actually wanted to use. Um, but that's the, the one it's using right now is the one from this uh, St uh, Steve Jacques uh, reference. Another thing you can do too is if you type, um, Ashlyn, if you type uh, jobs.ppf uh, or uppercase PPF. There we go, uh, yep. Yeah. E uh, mm -hmm. Type equals jobs.ppf equals. So you could change this if you said six, it would now change it when you run the job that when you run that beer Lambert law, now it's gonna run it with the differential path length. So it's gonna correct for scattering, but not the partial volume. You can also type in, if you do the same thing, Ashlyn, mm -hmm. and type the square brackets, um, let's say six space five, something like that. Uh, like this? Something like, yeah. So now when you run it, it's actually gonna, give a six to the first wavelength and a five to the second wavelength. So, so you can actually do it that way as, as well if, um, you know, depending on which system you're using or which wavelengths, there's, there's, you know, the differential path length does depend on wavelength a little. And if you wanna correct for that, you can do it that way. Um, another thing I've always wanted to do is put in that, you know, the, the correction for age. Uh, so we do have a uh, code that is not released in the toolbox where you just say DPF is, uh, you know, my DPF function of age and you put in the age of the subject and it'll actually use those tables to figure out what it should be, but it's not released yet. Maybe I'll put that in. Now that I've talked about it and said that it's there and people are gonna ask me for it, I'll have to put it in, <laughs> so. 
Yeah, no, that, that was exactly what I was going to say. So you can also use this if you already know your PPF for, for infants, for example, you can use this to, to change right now and you don't need to, to wait until your, your release, but it will be really great to have it, yes. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we got all the questions here. Uh, we will follow up with the questions. We will send them to, to Ted. So, so he can reveal and, and answer, and we will follow up with all the answers. Um, but we unfortunately have to move on. So we will go now with uh, to the Homer 3 part, and we will ask um, Blanca to help us with that. And well, first so, we'll just say goodbye to Dr. Huppert as well. Oh, no, yeah, sorry, oh, yeah, yeah, Dr. <laughs> Huppert, <to me>. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem, yes. thank, yeah, thank, thank you. you very much, Dr. Huppert. For being here, and we see see you uh, on Friday next week, right? Yep, absolutely. Friday. Yep, Friday. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Okay.